I mean, I'm supposed to do introductions, but you know what I mean? Welcome to The View. This is exciting. <laughs> she is a writer, professor, podcaster, editor. It's like, what can't she do? You want something done, give it to a busy person. Does she ever sleep? Roxanne Gay. <laughs> And she is a best-selling cookbook author, food writer, food equity advocate, and her turkey meatball recipe might be tastier than a shirtless usher at the Super Bowl. <laughs> it's Julia Tertian. <laughs> and I am your host this evening, Miss Michelle Buteau, author of Survival of the Thickest, also a TV show on Netflix, all eight episodes, streaming right now. You know what? You gotta really big yourself up like your Niecy Nash at the Emmys. <laughs> That's what life is about. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, Roxanne, can you give us some background on the series? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I will get serious, but I um, no, serious. What is the series? What is it about? Um, how did you come up with the idea? What does it mean to you? Because I feel like you are doing a lot, and now this. They approached me asking if I wanted to curate a series of essays. I had written a long form essay for them a few years ago and it was a wonderful experience. And I was like, yes, especially because I was going to be able to pay writers to actually do mm. the writing. Mm. And so I asked four writers I admire, what would you write about if you could write about anything and be fairly compensated? And these four writers, hi Katie, came back. Hi Katie. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, they answered the question in really beautiful ways. And so it's really a, just about putting really interesting, thoughtful work into the world. And uh, each of these authors is interesting and thoughtful and also beautiful, uh, which doesn't ha hurt. Like, no, let's, like, yeah, you eat with your eyes first, as my mom says. <laughs> <Ow>. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been really fun. Uh, it's been working on this for more than a year. And wow. Julia's essay is the first. How did you and Julia meet? We met online yes. and then through my wife, secondarily. And then one day uh, we invited Julia and her partner over for dinner. And Julia was like, I'll cook. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and then Julia brought over the best chicken I've ever had in my life. I think about it all the time. And we've been friends ever since. Can I tell you my version? Yes. <laughs> Um, I think my version. <laughs> this is all just very surreal. I'll just say that. But um, including when Roxanne and Debbie invited Grace and I, and I don't know why, but I was like, I'll just make the food. I don't know. And so we brought it from our house, which is like two hours away, to your home. And so it had to be warmed up. And so, um, you know, Debbie put it on the oven. I put it in the oven. And then Debbie offered to give us a tour of your home. And you guys have such a beautiful home and such like incredible, interesting, kind of quirky art and stuff. And I was like, I want to take all this in. And but then in the back of my head, I was like, the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and it was in the oven for so long. <laughs> it was. And so in my view, it was. It was a it was bad dry. Oven. Yeah. yeah. No, the, the, it was. Not, I didn't find it dry. But okay, at good, the time, good. I've thought about this for years. <laughs> at the time, we had this weird <laughs> oven. It was a Bertazzoni, which is this Italian brand. And <laughs> so like if you walk into a house and that's the oven just walk right out it's not for you and so it was always like a guess like hmm too high is not it 350 enough. yeah or is it 500 <laughs> we'll find out what uh, what kind of chicken i think it was what do you remember it was like a was, roasted chicken yeah there were some Ooh. onions involved yes garlic yeah Time Ooh, was and the, like a salad. I don't was know why I remember. Oh, the time, salad like, was under also under the good. skin. Was it under the skin or like in under, the over? Cabinets? Yeah, everywhere. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, she really got in there with the seasoning. Oh, I love, and that's how you show love. Yes, yes. The theme of tonight's event is holding space. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I've been told, <laughs> and nobody drug tests here. <laughs> well, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so Ooh. what? <laughs> what does holding space mean for you ladies? I think holding space means doing this, like just pausing. And it's so kind of all of you to come here. So many people came from far away just to be like present for what I'm saying into a microphone <laughs> right now <laughs> and all of us. And I think that, I think like pausing and coming together to just um, be together. And what about you? 
Uh, you know, I think it's similar. I, holding space is about creating, I think, opportunities for people and making sure that you put as few restrictions on it as possible so that when you welcome people into any given space, you're welcoming their whole selves as they are rather than as you would prefer them to be. And I really try to do that in everything I do. I do think holding space for one another is incredibly important. I don't think we do it enough. Mm. And so when opportunities like this come up to hold space and create space, I definitely jump at them. Mm. If you would have asked me five years ago, it, it would have been doing stand-up, bringing people together, mm -hmm. education through love and humor. But now holding space is like making time for me. I think we also need to hold space for ourselves. Yeah. And I don't know many people that do that at all for one reason or another. It can be really challenging to think, I deserve to hold space for myself. I deserve to take up space and to do so on my own terms. So I love hearing that. You know, you can't just show up and be Lizzo at the Grammys. You sort of like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could if you wanted to. I'm not trying to take away your dream, but you know what I mean? Like you, have to, you have to figure out, yeah, how to ask for something, but without putting a question mark on the end of it. I'm 49, and I still am... 45! Oh, hey! hey! <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, my fourth decade has been incredible. It's good, right? Oh, I have 46. to tell you, it's so good. I'm yes. turning 50 this year, and I can't wait, because the 40s, my 40s have been the best years of my life. Yeah. I, low bar, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that said, they've been exceptional. So, um, you know, like, I'm still learning, though, a lot of things, and I'm really working hard to not put a question mark at the end of what I would like to be a statement. Embrace high maintenance. It's okay. Yeah. I really want to know what the process was like writing this piece, because as I was reading it, it was I was like, okay, we should be friends, <laughs> because I, I felt very lonely. We have a lot of shared experiences, although I am the only child, so it was just like, I didn't even... I, had no one to even fight with. So when I was writing uh, my book, Survival of the Thickest, I was asked to do a book in 2015 and I couldn't get to it to 2019 because I hadn't had enough therapy. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't, I wasn't not in a loving relationship long enough, not only with my partner, but mainly myself. My mission now is it's not us that needs to catch up to the world, it's the world that needs to catch up to us. So what was your process like even writing this? That is so meaningful to hear. So just thank you, first and foremost. And um, I would have been so excited to be friends with you. <laughs> um, and I am right now. Uh, the process of writing this was so hard, um, but so good. And I, Roxanne at, you know, answered about how this came to be. and you know, her opportunity to reach out to writers, ask them to write about whatever they wanted, they would be well compensated. So I was on the other end of one of those emails. Um, and that is like a once in a lifetime thing where Roxanne Gay is like, says those things to you. Um, and I wrote back, you said uh, something to the effect of like, uh, you know, writing about something about food and community and bodies and stuff. And I said, well, uh, have you heard of powerlifting? <laughs> and um, I, wrote a first draft that I thought was really complete. Um, and I'm an impatient person, so I usually think first drafts are done. And then <laughs> Ro I've known for a long time what a brilliant writer Roxanne is, and I've mm -hmm. consumed her writing. But to the experience of being edited by Roxanne was incredible. Like, it makes me cry, like incredible. Like, she was so thoughtful and so in it, like in every sentence. And you basically just kept asking me over and over, like, okay, but how did it make you feel? Um, which is, we were talking about this earlier a little bit, that's like a really hard question <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. And I thought, uh, why not try to answer it? So I went back and um, just, just tried really hard. And I'm so happy I did because I feel so, um, so great to just have it out there like all this stuff that's been so hard now it's just now whoever wants to read it knows about it yeah. so now I just feel like super calm yeah <laughs> um really and that's been really cool but to your point I don't I definitely could not have written this two years ago five years ago ten years ago for all the reasons you named um 
not only because I hadn't found powerlifting yet, but just I wasn't in a place to be able to express all these things about my feelings. I didn't even know what my feelings were. I had no yeah. idea I had them. <laughs> um, yeah. So that took a while to figure that out. Um, and then to write something so personal and so vulnerable. But I'm just, I'm very supported. And I think that um, w was really helpful for me. And it was helpful to, or it's beautiful to have an experience to feel that from all these people in my life. I don't remember a lot of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And I look at pictures and I'm like, but when you are constantly going through shit, mm -hmm. it's like, it's fight or flight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really hard when people ask you how you're doing, mm -hmm. or like, how was it? Because you're like, oh, I guess I have to think about it, unpack it, relive it. And did you reach out to anybody while you were writing this or when you were done to say, hey, mm -hmm. what was this like? Do you remember this? Or, my bad, you're mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, mom and dad. <laughs> um, that's such a good question. I ran a draft by my friends and family who were mentioned, um, but the final version did shift quite a bit, and there were some things I actually chose to. There were details I went into that I felt like actually didn't serve the piece, and I took out, but. I left enough, my hope was to leave enough that people understood why this random weightlifting sport means so much to me. Right. Um, and it's actually led to um, in incredible like conversations with my family, with my brother specifically, who's not here. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I shared this with my parents, but after the piece came out, my brother listened to the audio version because I got to do the audio version. So my brother had the experience of listening like in his ear to me telling my version of events. Like if anyone has read or listened to the piece, like I talk a lot about like our childhood, but um, I didn't give the updated version, which is like things are really good between us now. And sharing this piece led to like the most beautiful communication with my brother that was so deeply healing. Like, and it was just such... I didn't know that was possible, and like I thought we were good, but now, but I was like, oh, we can actually talk about this stuff and acknowledge yeah. it and take accountability, both of us. And I guess uh, I have a question for you based on my own experience. Like, I feel like my body remembers. Yeah. So finding this sport and this embodied experience has been, I don't know if I could get to this place with having this conversation right now with my brother, all these things, had I not found this way to be in my body in a way I've never been. Yeah. I really thought I had it all figured out, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom, who was half white, did the best she could with what she had. But it was a lot of straighten your hair, cover your freckles, we're going to church. Mm -hmm. Why are your boobs so big? Stop sticking your chest out. I'm standing up straight. You told me to stand up straight. Why is that man looking at you? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know why there's a male gaze everywhere we go. You're supposed to tell me. Mm -hmm. I, from a really young age, developed a lot of, I think as we all have done in various ways, like developed my own coping mechanisms. Um, and a lot of them were tended towards, um, I feel like a little bit like what you were talking about earlier, just like, I think I always just wanted to be the most likable person in the room. So it affected every single relationship, like work, personal, yeah. everything. Because I wasn't showing up, like you said, in your holding space, like I wasn't never showing up as my full self. Because, and not even that I was like holding it back, I just didn't know her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing how long we can get by just with surface. Yeah. Whether it's with our friends or ourselves, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, oh my God. I, um, I want to talk about eating disorders mm -hmm. because, you know, I'm 46, so I, I don't know the first time y'all heard about eating disorders, whether it was like TV or, you know, um, you know, like one of those, what were those magazines that have like the gossip, um, the Inquirer? Like, mm, tabloid. Uh, yeah, yeah, tabloid, Mary Hart and John Tesh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ooh, those shoulder pads and the red lip. Mary, give it to me, give it to me, Mary. First time I heard about an eating disorder was probably the Carpenters. But wait a minute, she's so talented. How could she be sad? Mm -hmm. Like, I just didn't understand. And so when you realize that there was a disorder, mm -hmm. you know, I think it took us about three years to realize that, hey, my dad might be depressed. Mm. That's a lot of vodka. Mm -hmm. But he could work. Mm -hmm. 
and he helps me with my homework and he cooks all the food. Like he's fun he's not only functioning, he's high functioning. He's getting most done than sober people. You know what I mean? So like what was that like for you? I grew up in a very white, like very wealthy community. Um and I feel like eating disorders like everything are, you know, just I feel like the way things are framed along the lines of like race and class and all these things, like eating disorders were something I was familiar with because I grew up with a lot of like skinny, rich, white girls. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was named, but it was like this kind of uh, worst case scenario and someone had to look a certain way to get that title and to also get the care that might be helpful. Um, so it wasn't until I was much older that I realized like they can affect just about everyone, <laughs> like no matter like who or where you come from or, um, and I think my understanding of just body politics and fat politics in general, when I started to understand that, I think I realized like, oh, this thing that I thought was so normal, like I won't get into details because I know that can be like, you know, hard for folks and triggering, but like the things I was doing that I thought everyone was just doing. <laughs> right. And then to understand like, oh no, like there's a world in which you don't have to do those things. So I would say my living with it was um, tireless and regular and it felt normal. And then I think figuring out w the things I was living with felt like a tiny revolution because <laughs> I was like, oh, there's a whole other way to live. What I realize is that everyone is living this lie with you. Yeah. But you talk about your family's toxic trait is um, losing weight and not liking their body. And I mean, so, you know, in some respect, it is, it, it's all you know, it's normal, right? How do you start making a safe space for yourself when you didn't have one? Honestly, I feel like I'm looking at it. I have like so many amazing, like beautiful friends who have come into my life at, especially at this time in my life, who remind me just in the ways you guys are all living your lives, like there's more options. Um, when I think of the word safety, I like if I close my eyes and think of it, I just picture Grace, my spouse, and all of our pets, and we're just in our living room. How many pets? Oh, there's four. <laughs> there's, um, Grace will be so glad <laughs> that you asked. There's two dogs, a cat, and a bird. And the oh, bird, the wow. bird, yeah, the bird and Didn't I. Didn't see that coming. Yeah, me neither. Me <laughs> neither. <laughs> like, ooh, plot twist. <laughs> we started, uh, we started off the conversation oh, yeah. talking about chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Does your bird know that? <laughs> <laughs> I've been eating so much chicken because I sort of, I don't hate the bird. It's just hard. It's just really hard. I don't. I don't. <laughs> it's just, they know. I love that you say fat is not actually a feeling. Fat is just an adjective that describes the size of something. When and how, girl? <laughs> Poetry, bitch. <laughs> um, when, when and how? I, I can tell you pretty exactly, which is, again, thanks to Grace, um, who I just adore being married to. And the beginning of our relationship, um, I was like, I would say in just not a great place in my relationship with my body, but um, so I would say to Grace all the time, like, oh, I feel so fat. And Grace all the time would say, like, but what are you actually feeling? Or, like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, you know what I mean. And then, but Grace kept asking, and I just realized, like, I wasn't actually answering the question. And I was using the word fat as a placeholder for, like, a million other things. And then I had this big realization. We've talked about this on your podcast, and I shared it in the piece that I just, it felt like a lightning bolt. Because one day I was like, oh, I've only ever felt happy or fat. <laughs> Like, I've only had two feelings. And one isn't even a feeling. Right. <laughs> like, I've just used this word to describe, like, if I'm feeling tired or cranky or, like, someone, I don't know, there's an email I don't want to respond to and it's stressing me out, yeah. Yeah, whatever. Like, the list goes on and on and on. Or I'm angry, which is, like, something I've learned is something I actually feel, which is cool to discover. Um, that was, like, really eye-opening, like, incredibly eye-opening. And then I wor I've worked with, like, I I've tried every different type of therapy and I've worked with different therapists and really tried to yeah understand as much as I can and I used to think in therapy oh, if I dealt with everything else then all the food body stuff will just go away like I'll just deal with everything else but then once I started to actually work on that kind of head-on it just 
helps so many other things. And a lot of it, I think the word fat reminds me a lot of like the word queer and understanding the history of the word and my comfort with using it just feels like a really good precedent for myself. But I think it's also like in any community, I think you have to ask every, like, I just think it's good to ask people how they want to be identified and just use whatever word they tell you. I think that's what's so exciting right now, like what's happening at least. I mean, there is a lot of garbage that's happening, but there's so much good. And so I have to live in the good because I don't want it to age a bitch. (laughs) Does Angela Bassett look bothered about anything? (laughs) It's a no. It's a miracle. Every time I see her, it's just like, because like in person, she looks even younger. And it's like, what? What? And I, she's on this show that's not very good called 911. Yeah. <laughs> and she's great on it. But what I love about it, it's clear that Angela's just like in her collecting the biggest check. She's the highest paid woman yes. in television right now. Yes. Making like $750,000 an episode. Ooh, baby. I'm not putting her business out there. I read it in like people. And <laughs> what's so great is that she looks flawless. She clearly goes and she's like, I could do this in my sleep. But then she puts on like the full Angela Bassett for yes. what is not the deepest of all roles. <laughs> and I love that for her because if anybody has earned the right to collect that check 24 times a year, it's Angela Bassett. Amen. <laughs> and she does look flawless and young and dewy. And I'm just like, the where dewy are your part. pores? What is, what is this? Let's get into powerlifting. Oh. I feel like, I don't know what the first time going to the gym was like for y'all, but I feel like it's not set up for the thickums. What was it like for both of y'all? First time, gym. So it was really quite terrible because I'm from Nebraska and I'm a child of immigrants. And so I did not know what field hockey and lacrosse and I kind of vaguely knew what hockey was. So not only was I learning like this new space of exercise, I was surrounded by a bunch of white people who clearly like did this for a living and <laughs> loved it and were so happy and they were like, all right, Chip. And <laughs> so it was really overwhelming. And so I went as little as possible. Like I did the bare minimum to pass. Right. And didn't go back to a gym again until my late twenties. And then I was just terrified. Yeah. Because gyms like People tell you, oh, lose weight, go to the gym. And then you go to the gym and they make fun of you. Yeah. And it's just like, you need to pick one because this mixed message is not working for me. I'm down if someone's doing a hard workout, but when you are giving like an American Idol audition, it's it's terrible. I gotta go. And men sweat so much. And sometimes they don't wipe. It's very upsetting to me. (laughs) And when they grunt and they groan at Equinox. I don't want to name names. Oh! However, oh my the men there really put on a performance. They really do. And yeah. I'm just like, I know that you guys are performing for each other yes. and that this is not for me. <laughs> but I can hear you. So, yeah, how did you yeah. get into powerlifting? I've had, like, every gym experience you could name. I've been to, like, every class. I've um, worked with personal trainers. I've been to small gyms. I've been to big gyms. I've, I've tried it all. Um, and based on that experience, powerlifting feels so different to me. Um, and it's a place, you said at the beginning, like gyms are not dis- like designed for people who are thick and, or thickums, excuse me. I and mean, <laughs> level, level, level. Pa- in powerlifting, it's like, it's cool to be big. It's really cool. And it's like, you can actually move a lot of stuff, like the bigger you are, which is really cool. I had a very obsessive, compulsive, relationship with exercise and sort of working out and to me the purpose of that was always to make myself smaller um and then I took a break from that I worked at a farm I took a break from like cookbook stuff and I just when that farm season ended I had like a little I don't know third of a life crisis or something and I went to work at the farm and when it ended and I was trying to figure out what from my old life to incorporate um I wanted to continue to be in my body and to move it, but I didn't want to go back to all those things I was doing. I want a chance to remember how strong I am, like a few times a week. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your heart and your soul. I feel like there's questions for the audience. Hi. (laughs) 
I'm cur- I'm also a power lifter oh, and a Leo, maybe a double cool. Leo, but I don't know what that means. So I might be. You're rising. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Um, I'm curious about your relationship with clothes and oh. powerlifting. So I know a lot of people, myself included, when you first start, like your body changes and how you present yourself and what you want to wear and what you currently have, and you're getting bigger sizes and yeah. you may not be comfortable with that. Just if you can talk about that a little bit. It's been a big deal for me to learn that like you can just buy clothes that fit even if they're a size you wish they weren't. And the minute I put them on, I am no longer thinking about clothes. And that's been a huge deal. Because I used to think about clothes all the time because I was wearing clothes that I wished fit, even though they didn't. So I was thinking about them constantly because they were really uncomfortable. (laughs) And then I just got, like, pants that fit me. Like, I ordered this jacket. My friend Greg just married one of my best friends, Amelia. Greg's here. And I bought this suit for their wedding. And I ordered it in the size I thought I was. And then it was, like, a little tight. And I I just left it hanging there because I was like, oh, maybe, maybe. And then I was like, what the fuck am I doing? And I just ordered the next size. And it was fine. My question is, the days that you're going to lift and you have no motivation, where do you find it? Because I feel like the times when we need motivation, mm-hmm. we don't, like, where the hell is it? So. Sure. My motivation is that I don't, I really don't care how much I lift. I mean, I care, like, we're doing the competition. I, like, I have a complicated relationship with the numbers of it all, but, like, on those days, I'm like, I just want to go show up for myself because going means I've like set this time aside for something that has nothing to do with my professional life, nothing to do with like relationships or any like it's like this thing I do for me. So if I just show up and just kind of hang out, <laughs> like once I get there, I'll usually do something. But if it's not all the things I thought I was going to do or whatever, like that's fine. Um, but I like I like showing up for myself. It feels really good. So that motivates me. I'm Sarah, thank you so much. I would like to ask if you were to put kind of the crux of healing in one major statement that you would want to share with all of us, what would you say is the most healing impact that you have experienced with all of this? And thank you. Finding out all the parts of yourself is worth doing. And I think sharing those parts with whoever you feel comfortable to share them with is worth doing. Thank you for sharing. (laughs) Thank you both so much and I just I, I just can't believe this and I just thank you for inviting me to be part of it thank you for coming Duh. my 7th grade <laughs> BFF <laughs> <laughs> thank you everyone for coming out thank you Roxanne, thank you Julia thank you for holding space with us tonight bitches and thank you to Universal Standard for making a real ass size 20 <laughs> Good night.